morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I think everyone's asleep. Good morning, everybody. How are you? It's good to see everybody here at Head of Falls. I gotta say, this is such an awesome blessing and opportunity to be congregating in the city of Waterville with an opportunity to worship the Lord, with the freedom to do that, and to have Waterville hear this worship. It is good to be here with everyone. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that we can raise your name in this place, Lord. Exalt you. Lord, we, we thank you that you sit over everything, Lord, that you are over all of this that we're in, the situation, each one of our lives, Lord. We thank you that you are there. Right now, we just acknowledge that. We thank you for those blessings, and we thank you for the work that you will continue to do. Lord, let this worship be a part of that. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be here and touch each person, Lord. That we would have a conversation with you today. Lord, let this worship be glorifying to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Oh, uh-huh. 
stood before creation. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. Lord, we thank you that you are here, that you meet with us, Lord. Lord, let that continue into this message. Let this just be an introduction, a beginning of the conversation, Lord, with our soul and your Holy Spirit, Lord. Just we invite you and acknowledge you here. Thank you for being our Savior, Lord, that we can call upon your name. Lord, bless this message. Bless John's words, Lord. Give him those words. Let them be yours and let them be true. Let them be speaking right to our hearts, Lord. We do thank you for these things and the chance to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is a beautiful day. Yeah. thought it was going to be hot, and then the breeze came, so I am really happy. Um, <laughs> and it's shady, actually, so this is nice. I'm not going to get a sunburn. So, uh, today we are in Psalm chapter 36, so if you have Bibles, go ahead and open up there. Um, I'm hoping all you guys have your stomachs full. If you haven't, it's your fault, because we had a lot of food. <laughs> And actually, have some left over. So, if you still want to get some afterward, I think there's a little left over. I shouldn't say that because they're probably out. But um, I hope you guys got your fail food. Love doing this. I love being out here. Um, we would do it every single week if it wasn't such a hassle, to be honest. Uh, but it is. It's great to be here. I see a lot of new faces. So, uh, my name is John Avery. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm the lead pastor. And so, I would love to get to know you. So, if afterwards, if you would love to hang out and talk. Love to talk to you. Um, also, if you got if you came here the first time, you should have got a coffee mug. If you haven't, make sure you stop the food cart on the way out. Get a little coffee mug. Inside the coffee mug is a I'm new card. Fill that out. Put your name on it. Write whatever you want. Um, and we would love to connect with you. Tell us tell you a little about a little bit about our church. Um, I would love to meet you as well. If you have to leave afterwards. So, anyways, make sure you do that. But thanks for being here. So. Um, one quick announcement we don't have a lot so the one quick announcement is the food cart this week is going to be at green street park which is that away it's in the south end and so um it will be there on saturday from 11 30 to 1 30 i believe i think i'm right and so uh some of you guys are here uh, because you've enjoyed the food cart and you've uh been eating every single week and so we'll be in the south end this week so come on out get some free food um also just just to say this uh if you are like a, a member or just somebody that you consider yourself a part of living in water uh, come to it if you have time saturday from any time between uh, 11:30 and 1:30, just to come hang out. It's a really, I think it's really great for us as a church to come and not not saying you have to serve, just show up and be there and just talk to people and uh, make it kind of like a, a church picnic as well. And so uh, I would love to see as many of us from Living Water out there as we can. Even if you just get for 15, 20 minutes, just come on out uh, and get some free food. Why not? So um, I'm gonna pray for us and then we'll dive into. Psalm so 36 this morning. Father, thank you for this ability to do this. God, thank you for uh, everyone that came out, and uh, thank you for the food, God, that you provided for us, Lord. Um, God, I pray that you would take this Psalm, Psalm 36, that we're going to dive into this morning, and really make it alive in our hearts, God. Just um, convict us challenge us, mold us, whatever you want to do in this passage this morning, uh, just do it, Lord. Do it inside of our hearts. Maybe even uh, this morning is the day that we would give our lives over to you. Maybe that's that's what you want to do in our heart, God. But I pray for this entire uh, message, Lord. It's not my words, people hear. It's your word, God. And so I pray that that would come forward uh, this morning and people would hear from you. Um, and as we continue, God, to pray uh, just for our country and the world around us, God, I pray you will be glorified through all everything going on. 2020 has been a crazy year, God. And But I truly do believe, as we talked about last week uh, in, in Psalm 29, 
that uh, when the storm is coming, as Jen reminded me this morning, uh, we all cry glory, God. And the storm has been hitting us one thing after another, God, but may we as your people cry glory in the midst of that storm. So uh, just do a work in this community in Warnerville. Do a work all around us, God, and use us as living water. And other churches as well, other churches that are preaching your word, that are true to the, the, the gospel. God, I pray you use them as well. Just We'd see this community transformed by you because you are the only thing that's been transformed in this community. It's nothing else. Nothing else would transform people's lives and a community except for you, God. So I pray you do that um, in lower minds, Lord. So uh, be with us this morning. We dive into your word. And we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So Psalm chapter 36. So if you are new, we are in a series right now called Summer of Psalms, and what we're doing is each week we are uh, reading a psalm, and it's a, it's a series that comes with a challenge, so if you are new with us, what we are doing is for the summer, uh, we are reading a psalm every single day, it's a challenge to every day, some point in your day, to read one psalm, and then when we come together on Sunday morning, we'll go over uh, the psalm that we'd be on this morning, uh, that day. So today is Psalm 36. Next week is Psalm chapter 43. And so if you haven't been following along and keeping up this challenge, start this week. Or if you fell behind, start this week as well. Just get into a habit of reading God's Word every single day. It takes literally probably two minutes, sometimes one minute to read the Psalm. It doesn't take a whole long time. And so just put some time aside every single day to look into God's Word and I think you would find your life just more full of joy and really God just work on you in that way. So um, so today we're in Psalm 36 and this psalm is once again uh, a heavy one. Uh, I think every one we've gone through so far is just they're it's just heavy. Um, and I think the reason why is David is uh, speaking from his heart. We're, we're reading stuff that David, most of these are from David, and it, he is just going through some difficult things in his life, and then he just pours it all out to God on paper. And so most of these are prayers to God. And so uh, today, Psalm 36, no different. There is there's going to be some heaviness in this sermon, uh, some things that will make us uncomfortable. And you can blame me all you want, but I am just reading the text. So that's it. Uh, so... That's what we're going to find this morning is another heavy psalm. And this one, Psalm 36, is actually uh, in, the, in the lament category. So same thing as Psalm 22, we went through that. This is a lament. Uh, if you remember, lament is a cry out to God. It's a prayer. It's usually done when something is going on inside of someone's life, and you just basically you word vomit on God. That's why I want to put it. You just pour out all your emotions, all your frustration, all your anger. You just give it all to God. You just tell him everything that's going on inside your life. You're just saying, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I think. And you're not holding anything back. And so sometimes we read stuff like Psalm 22, where it said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why you left me? Where are you? And like, and so some of this is, it seems like, how could somebody say that to God? How can someone do that? But the idea is you're just, everything that's going on in your mind, your heart, God knows that anyways, and you're just getting it out in the open. You're just you're just telling it all to, to God. So and if you remember back to Psalm 22, in almost every lament, and in this one, this is the same way, what you find is you got in the moment reality, you have an in-the-moment reality, you got something going on, usually this is the problem that someone is facing, and then you have a reflection. And so you reflect on something going on in your life. You reflect on uh, how God's promises have come true. You reflect on Scripture, on your own life, and you just reflect back how, of how good and powerful God is. And then the third section is either praise or prayer. And this psalm is, follows the same exact pattern. Or in the moment reality, a problem, a reflection, and then a prayer or a praise. Today we have three sections in this song, broken out just perfectly in a way. It's the, and we're going to cover each one of these parts. And you find this on the back of your uh, worship guide. There's some notes there. I don't know if you guys ever knew there's notes there, but there are. Uh, so there's notes in the back. But what you find is just three sections. The first is verse 1 through 4, the wicked who love evil. This is the in-the-moment reality. The second thing is God's steadfast love that protects, which is a reflection. And the third section is a prayer of protection from the wicked, which is, like I said, it's, it's a prayer. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to break down each three of these parts. And the first thing we're going to find is the first section, verse 1 through 4, is the problem. The in the moment reality. The, the thing that David is facing inside of his life. So let's uh, read verse 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes, that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. And he does not reject evil. So this first four verses here starts out really heavy and convicting in a way. And when I first read this this week, uh, I immediately implied this to my own life, verse 1 through 4. And my wife, we usually try to read the verse that we're going to cover on Sunday together. And so she read it. She thought the same thing as, as reflecting on her own life and just reading these first four verses and, and even looking at just the past couple days in, in both of our lives, reflecting. Transgression speaks to the wicked. The idea is sin speaks to the wicked. There's no fear of God in his eyes. Like we've all have heard this voice in our mind, hey, do this, hey, try this. That's the idea. Sin speaks to the wicked. And when you sin, there's no fear of God. You're not thinking about, okay, uh, how this might upset God. You're not thinking about how this sin is going to kind of cause a disturbance in your relationship with God. You're not thinking about that. You're not thinking when you sin of how that sin that you are committing right now is what nailed Jesus to the cross. It wasn't the Romans. I mean, Romans literally nailed the, the nails into his hands and his feet. But you got to understand, he could have said a word and killed every Roman in that, that entire city in the moment. It was, it was the sin of us that held him to that cross. That's what it was. We don't, we don't think about that, right, when we sin. And then verse 2. Like I, I read the rest. Like I, could, I could relate to each one of these lines in my own life. Verse 2 says, For he flatters himself in his own eyes, that, it, that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. Like his, the idea is, and we all do this, we make excuses for our sin. We flatter ourselves. Like, it's not that big of a deal if I did this one thing this one time. And, and we do this so we don't feel guilt. Right? We try to make these excuses up and try to downplay the sin we're doing because we don't want to feel the guilt and the shame that comes from sinning. Or you think of other people. Well, well, they do this. Well, well, we would think sometimes, well, I used to do this, so it's not as bad, but it's still wrong, right? It doesn't matter what you used to do. It doesn't matter how, I mean, it's great how far you've come, but still, the thing you were doing is still wrong. It's still sin. You look at verse 3, and I, this one that speaks to me as well. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He ceases to act wise and do good. I mean, it's simple. When you sin, you cease to act wisely and do good. You're acting foolishly. You're doing the what? You're doing the thing that you know you hate. You're doing the thing that you do. You know does not bring you satisfaction in life and does not bring you enjoyment. But you still do it anyways. You're not acting wisely. You're acting foolishly. You've chosen the wrong path. And the last verse, verse four, he plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that's not good. He does not reject evil. I mean, haven't we all done this? Where, where it's not, I mean, it says on your bed, but where you, where you try to plot how you're going to sin. Where you, where you, I mean, while it might be on your bed, where you're laying there on your bed or on your couch, and you start to have that temptation sink in. Maybe something of the past, maybe something you've done recently, whatever, but whatever it is, that temptation starts to creep in, and you plot a way that you're going to give in to that sin. You plot a way of this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to make excuses for doing it. Well, I need to do this because if I don't, I'm going to have this feeling. So you, you plot in your mind how you're going to go down the wrong path. And you set, yourself, you set yourself up for failure. And you do not reject evil. Instead of rejecting evil and rebuking the sin, you accept it. You allow it into your life. You allow it to seep in. Something I've, I've shared before, and I'll just share it again. It, it's, it's something that I... I try my hardest to do and I've told many of you guys this but it comes from uh, John Piper said that y y you have about five seconds before to when that sin that temptation comes in your mind to get it out you got five seconds 
So when that sin comes in, that temptation comes in, you got to immediately rebuke that sin and say, I'm not going to do that. But when you let that thing sink in for more than usually, I mean, it's just a thing. It could be 10 seconds, let's say. When that, starts, when that starts to sink in, when that sin starts to come in, you're more likely to not reject it, not rebuke it. You're more likely to accept it and fall into temptation. So like I said, when I'm first reading this psalm, before doing any study in this this week of, of what this text is saying and, and what David is trying to mean by Psalm 6 and what God is trying to portray, I really thought this was a self-reflection of David. I thought David was reflecting on his own life. Maybe David just fell into temptation again. Maybe he fell short, and he's calling himself the wicked person. But David was saying that he's the wicked person. He's the wicked one. Because I look at my life, and I'm sure all of us in this park, if we truly evaluate our life compared to these four verses, and we put ourselves up against this, we all would say, yep, that's me, right? Verse 1 through 4, that's me. I've done every single one of these things. Maybe in the past week, maybe even just this morning you did it. But this text is actually, when you study into this, and you get some of you guys will be relieved, but still, I think it's good to self-reflect. But this text is actually not describing a follower, follower of Christ. It's not. It's not describing one of God's people. And pet, instead, it's describing a person that literally has no fear of God. That when they sin, they laugh and they mock those who don't fall into the sin. They, they have no hesitation to sin. There's no pause before they do it. When, when temptation sinks in, you know, a lot of us as, as Christians, we have a pause, like, shouldn't do this. I don't want to do it. Maybe you might fall into it, but there's still there's a pause there. This text is not speaking of a person that has that pause. It's deep inside of their heart. They have pushed away all guilt. They make excuses for the sin. They've made a way for them to not hate their sin anymore, but instead they love their sin. They Every single chance they get, they want to fall into the sin. They deceive themselves. And they, fuel, and they also do, try to drag others in to fuel their passions and desires. They even plot evil plot ways to sin, to come up with ways to hurt themselves and others. They've gone to a point where they do not reject evil ever. They're just running to it. Now, I don't think it's wrong, though, to evaluate ourselves compared to this text. I think it's actually a good thing to do. I don't think it's wrong at all. Because to look at our life and figure out where we're falling short. We're all falling short. And that's the whole point. We're constantly being molded into becoming more like Christ. And we all, we, we need to, I honestly, on a daily or at least a other, every other day basis, reflect on verses like this and say, where am I messing up? Where am I falling short? How do I need to change? But the difference is, if you evaluate your life and you see maybe a place where you're falling short, maybe a place where you find yourself say, well, I, I am the wicked person here. The difference is if you are, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you will make a change. You will repent of that sin. You will run to God instead of making excuses for the sin. That's the difference. Like a question I get asked often, and I actually was asked this last week by uh, a friend of mine, is I keep on sinning. I can't stop. I even plot sin. I don't reject this sin. And the question that always comes from this, and maybe some of you are thinking this right now, am I really a Christian? Am I really a Christian if I keep on falling into sin? And, and, and I usually answer that question first off, I don't know for sure. I don't know if any of you in this place are Christian. Right? I don't know if anybody, I don't know if, I, I cannot say for certain that any single one of you are going to go to heaven without a shadow of a doubt. I don't really know. I don't know your heart. What I usually tell people is the fact that you are wanting to stop sinning is a clear indication that the Spirit is working in your heart. Like, I mean, if you, if you, had, no, if you had no desire to reject evil, then that's a, it's a clear indication to me that maybe you're not a follower of Christ. Because you haven't got to the point where you have recognized your sin and recognized that it's wrong. The fact that you are questioning, am I really Christian? I just keep on sinning and I don't want to do this. The fact that you do not want to sin is showing me that there's some fruit in your life. 
that God and, and Christ the Spirit is working in you to mold you into something different. If you have no pause, I have no guilt, I'd be really, really worried. I would. Because a wicked person experiences no fear of God and no rejection of evil. So, so to recap quickly here, verse 1 through 4, before we get into the next section, is speaking of a wicked, evil person. Wicked, evil, pure evil. Wicked people that, as we continue reading through the psalm, we're going to see that they have made war with David in a way. They're creating strife and conflict in David's life. And we, and we don't know exactly what's going on as we go through this text, but it's something significant. Because one thing that you, you're going to notice in, in this psalm, and throughout all the psalms, in fact, is that David, when he talks about, when he talks about the wicked person, he's usually talking about his enemies. And I think it's important to understand this, of who's, who the wicked person is and who the enemy is in here. Because when David mentions enemies, he's usually, in this text as well, He's talking about these enemies are surrounded, are surround him. They're on each side of him. They're attacking him in a way. And then he cries out to God for them, for for God to save him. And when reading these texts, if you're following along in the Psalms, you might have found it some somewhat hard to relate sometimes when you get to the passages where David's talking about enemies on all sides. And he, and he's really and, he, and he's and when he's talking about enemies, he does mean humans. Many times, if you actually look at the backstory of some of these psalms, uh, David is uh, mentioning enemies like Saul, where he's on his run for his life for years and years and years. David did nothing wrong, but the king Saul, jealous, wanted him dead. David was, was a, a, a war king in a way. David constantly was battling, constantly, constantly was fighting. He had war on every side. If it wasn't the Philistines, it was somebody else. He was always in battle against enemies, constantly. Even his son Absalom rose a, 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 a revolt up against him, an uprising. David had to run for his life, again, from his own son. So when David is mentioning his enemies, he's normally meant meaning a physical enemy that's surrounding him. But I want to bring us back to, to really understand who the wicked person is. Because... When David writes with enemies, yes, they're, they're a human enemy, but there's something else behind that human enemy, and that's what we've got to focus on. If you remember back at our, our study of, of Ephesians, we focused on the enemy, the fight that we have for the gospel, right? We went to Ephesians chapter 6, we went to uh, verse 12, which says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against cosmic forces of darkness in this in this spiritual realm. And it's very important to know this, and I'm going to bring this back to our attention again, because, because our enemies we face are not human. They're not human. The spirit, that our enemy is instead the spirit that is at work inside of the humans. Right, it's a spirit at work inside the wicked people. That is our enemy. It's not a human being. It is the ruler of these people, the ruler of darkness. Ephesians 2.2 2 says that there is a prince of the power of the air that is at work in the sons of disobedience. In this ruler, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of darkness, is Satan. And he's blinding, he's enslaving the wicked. So this is why this is so important to understand. When we talk about the wicked person, as we get to these next few verses here. Because our enemies are not people. And the reason why I make this sure we understand this is because we all know wicked people. And we could look at verse 1 through 4 and we could say, I know people that are bad and evil and I want nothing to do with them. But here's the thing I want us to remember. Christ loves those people as much as he loves you. Like it, Christ wants all people to know him. His desire is that none will perish. None will perish. Even the most evil of evil people, God loves. And Christ died for. 
we have to keep that on our minds at all times because very quickly if we start labeling people wicked stay away you're my enemy we are going to miss the understanding of the great commission we're going to miss the understanding of go and make disciples of all nations as wicked as they might be as bad as they might be as awful as the past they might have we are called to reach those people So the wicked person has tormented David in this text are the spiritual forces of darkness. And yes, they work through people, and yes, we are going to have a hard time with some people in our life, and some of those people will never ever come to Christ. We are called to love every single one of those people. And remember that the wicked people, the wicked, the wicked people that we see, them themselves, there's something, there's something in every single one of them. There, there is some goodness in there if they turn their life over to Christ. And we've got to remember that. And they're being led in this moment by the prince of the power of the air. They're being led by darkness. They're being led by Satan himself. So I'm not sure who David is dealing with exactly. I don't know exactly what's going on, but David is up against some kind of enemy. And before we start to try to think in our life of this wicked people, wicked person in our own life, I want to ask you this. kind of bring some self-valuation back to what we talked about in the beginning. What is the wickedness, the evil, the sin that is crouching at your door right now? What temptation oops, What temptation keeps knocking and knocking and knocking on the door right now? Who is the person in your life that is persistent in mocking and pulling you away from Christ? Because the reason why I, I ask that question is because just as much as sin and evil is knocking at your door, if we all feel that, there's another person knocking at your door who wants you even more, but not for evil, not to suffer, but he wants you for good. Look at verse 5 through 9. David now is moving to, the, to reflections. In the moral reality of the problem, there's wicked people all around him. They're mocking him. They're, they're, I don't know exactly what they're doing. I say mocking, but that's what I'm imagining. There's something going on with wicked people. Verse 5 through 9, David then says this. A reflection of who God is. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. I love this, this line. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your, in your light do we see light. Love. I love those few verses right there. And I love the imagery that's being portrayed in this text. Like, you get the imagery first off about what we just talked about. The wicked pounding at your door. The wicked surrounding you. The wicked just, just wrecking havoc on your life. Whatever they're doing. And they're yelling. They're trying to pull you away. They're trying to consume you. You try to run. You try to hide. And they will not leave. And then you understand there's, there's another, another knock at the door. There's another path. There's another side. If you choose, if you choose to open this door, you're going to find life. You're going to find exactly what David's talking about here in verse 5 through 9. And I love the imagery. A steadfast love that extends, like, a steadfast love that extends far beyond human reach. Extends to the heavens. A steadfast love that is good, that, that judges you rightly. Not by your outward appearance, not by your past, not by not by what other people think about you, but by what's going on inside your heart. One that his goal is to save you. One that will come, and I just love that this the shadow of your wings, right? One that you can take refuge in, and like the shadow of your wings, like just just picture. Um, I picture like an angel. I don't know if God or Christ exactly has wings, but 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 whatever it is, like just the idea is just comforting. The shadow of your wings, like the wings just covering you, like like you're you're the eagle's young, right? And he's just covering you up, and all this stuff is coming against you, but you're in your father's wings in your father's arms. 
The one that says it, if you come into the door, if you walk through the door, he says, you will feast on the abundance of my house. Just think about that, the abundance of my house. Like, come and drink the river of your delights. Get out of the darkness you are in and find true life, the life you were meant to live. Like, like, and I was just reading this week, and I was just meditating on these verses, and just, just getting all this imagery, and just picturing in my mind, like, um, I, I, all I could think of is a movie scene. And probably many of us could probably think of uh, different movies. I couldn't really think of exactly one, but just images started to pop up in my mind of, like, a war, war scene, where you have, like, this, uh, you're by yourself, and you're on the run, and you have these enemies trying to get you, and they want to kill you. They want you to be dead. And you're on the run, so you're hiding behind this tree, and they're searching for you. And many of us probably can think of a movie right now where you've got that scene where they're searching for you, and they're, and they're all around you. And all of a sudden, someone comes up. They grab you by the hand and say, hey, follow me. I'll save you. i got a place. And so you go to where they're staying. And you open the door, and as you open the door, there's other people in there, and they're all joyful, it's full of light, and you look at the table, and there's a giant feast on the table. All the food you can imagine, everything, all, everything you've ever wanted in life is right there in front of you. And when you enter into that door, all the fear, all the anxiety, all the, the loneliness, everything you were feeling, all that negativity, gone. Immediately when you walk through that door. A total contrast of what you were just experiencing. That's what I pictured. Now, when we see that contrast, right? You're on the run for your life, and then you can enter into a house that's just so full of joy. If someone grabs you by the hand, or is knocking at the door and said, Come in. Like, come in. I think every single one of us would say, Yeah, okay, I, I, I'm going to go. Like, I, I'm, I'm in. Every single person, if we knew that Christ, Christ is the one grabbing your hand, right? He's the one saying, come to shelter. If we knew, we, every single one of us said, yes, I will follow Christ in my entire life. So why do so many of us choose not to answer the door? Why do so many of us choose not to answer the knock of the enemy, but to instead to follow the path of the wicked? And I'm speaking to Christians as well here. Why? Why do we choose to be consumed with evil so many times in our life? And it's because many times what we do is we choose the, the, the knock that's the loudest. Many times we choose the knock that's persistent. Their lies sound intriguing. And there's a part, every single one of us, the Bible says that the, the man is, is wicked. Deep in his heart, where we're wicked. The part, every single one of us that wants to do wrong, even though we know it ends in destruction, we still, we want to follow the wrong path. And this is why David ends this psalm in verse 10 through 12, the last two verses, or three verses, with a prayer, with a plea. Look at verse 10, it says, Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. In your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of the arrogant come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen, they are thrust down, unable to rise. In these three verses, David has two pleas. The first is in verse 10. His first plea is God, continue to love me, continue to be there for me. Do not leave me. Do not just just leave me abandoned. Don't abandon me. Don't let. Don't astray. Leave me astray, God. Like I just hold me upright, God. Help me be able to battle. Help me to stand against the enemies that are all around me. They're pounding at my door right now, God. And give me the strength right now through Your love to be able to stand against temptation, temptation that I'm feeling right now in my life. The first is a prayer of God. Just give me the strength. And the second plea is one that I think is sometimes hard for us to pray. The second plea I lay with is the wicked, the wicked to be driven away, the wicked to leave, the wicked that, that they would be cast down, they would be unable to rise, that they would be defeated. 
You're praying for the, the wicked, the sin that is at the door that every one of us knows is there to be crushed by God's might. And I want to, as I come to an end, I want to read this verse to us because this is, this whole thing, I, I think this sums up what has to be going on inside of our, our, our hearts. It's in the book of James. James chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. It says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Now this is a heavy verse, but what I love about this verse is this. How amazing is it that we have a God that says, Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Like if you come to me, if you come near me, if you answer that knock at the door, I am going to allow, I'm going to invite you in. I'm going to bring you in. Like God that knows, this is the amazing thing about this, God that knows your every desire, good and bad. He knows you. He knows you better than any other person in this world. He knows your thoughts as messed up as your probably many of our thoughts are. And God has a, has a table set for you. And every good thing on this table, a feast of abundance, a, a, a drink with a cup of every one of your delights, He has that available for you, drawing near to you. But the reason why many of us will never step through that door and will never draw near to God is because of, instead of resisting the devil and him fleeing, When he knocks on the door, you immediately let him in. And when you, when you start asking, why is temptation so loud in my life? Why do I keep feeling this? Why do I keep falling into this? Why do I keep having this temptation? Why isn't it left yet? Like, I, I continue to journey to God. I continue to run to him. But I still am feeling this persistent temptation in my life. Why am I feeling that? And I don't know exactly why, but I, I'm going to guess it's because you are not rejecting the devil, you're not fleeing from him, and you're not drawing near to God. Instead of fleeing, you are just stepping in. You are letting him come right in. And if that's you, this, this verse in James, what, what, it, what it's trying to get us to understand is what you must do. Humble yourself before a holy God. And instead of laughing over your sin, mourn over your sin. Instead of finding joy in your sin, be in gloom of how this has ruined your life. And draw near to God by recognizing that this sin that you keep falling into is wrong. And God hates it. Put a light. We have to put a light on the wickedness that is down the door right now. I love a verse that, that God, uh, God said to Cain in the book of Genesis. And it's a verse that just is always in my mind. Right before uh, Cain killed his, his brother Abel, God said to Cain, says, sin is crouching at your door, and you must master over it. Sin is crouching at your door. Temptation is sinking in. Jealousy is, is crouching at your door, and you've got to master over it, or you're going to fall. And how do we master over the sin? How do we do it? How do we master over the wicked? A verse that many of you probably thought you knew I was going to go to, with the whole knocking thing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Where it says, Behold, I stand at the door, Jesus saying this, at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. thing I would have us all understand and I said this is not just for non-Christians for all of us I need this reminder all the time he is knocking at the door he is knocking at the door and he's knocking at the door many of your lives right now the question is will you open the door that's it will you, are you going to open the door will you draw near to him again if you, if you understand what you're drawing near to all of us are going to say yes but it takes this. Stop running to the devil. Stop running to wickedness. Stop resisting the devil. Stop resisting that temptation. And what you're going to find is any single person that has dealt with temptation, especially if you talk to any person in recovery, what they'll tell you is the, the farther you get away from it, the, far, the, more, the more you resist that, the easier it gets. The same with any single sin you are dealing with in your life. The more you resist it, the more you run from it, the easier it will get. Not saying that temptation won't come again. Not saying it's not going to still, still going to be there. It's always going to be there. But we must resist the devil and run and draw near to God. The thing I have to say to this, just to end this, is that you don't have to be perfect to open that door. Right, if you are not a Christian in this room, this is for you. You don't have to be perfect to open that door. In fact, it's quite opposite. Romans 5 verse 8 said, God shows his love for us in this by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ died to free us from the evil that runs our life and ruins our life. He died, he died to make a way for us to eat at his table. And when he rose from the grave, he rose over the one thing that keeps us from the table. And that's sin. You will not conquer sin on your own. You will not do it. You cannot resist the temptation on your own. You can try and try and try. And you might do it for a while and you might even, you might, but what, what, what many times might happen is you might just switch the sin. You might not do this anymore, but you're going to do this. The only way to be truly free and the chains to be broken is to turn your life over to Christ. It's the only way. is to open the door to allow Christ to come in your life. And the way to do this is confess your sin to Him. Make Him your King. Surrender your life over to Him and He will cleanse you from all the sin in your life. He will make you new. And to end this, I just have one line and I want to pray. The table is set. The question is, will you open the door? The table is set for every single one of us and will you open the door to Him? Let's bow our heads and let's, let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you. That we, every single one of us have the opportunity to open that door, God. No matter our past, no matter what we've done, no matter the, what we have, have failed, even in the past hour, God, maybe we failed. Even in the past ten minutes, I don't even know. We have failed. We have fallen short. We have run to the devil instead of fleeing from him. But God, the amazing truth is that right now, right now, we can open the door and you will come in and you will give us everything we want. You will give us joy and peace and satisfaction, God. And what I pray for right now, God, is for, for all the Christians here that, are, that, are, that have done this, that have given their life over you, that right now, they run from that sin, they confess it. They confess whatever it is they keep doing in their life. They, can, they just bring it to you and say, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to flee from this. And God, would you continue to be persistent inside of their life. And, and just, when, I hate to say this, but when they sin, let them feel it. Instead of making excuses for the sin they keep falling into, God, let them feel the weight of that sin. The sin that you died for. Let them feel that, God. And for the non-Christians in this, in this place, God, I pray for the same thing. You would convict them. The Holy Spirit convicts. The, your Word convicts. And God, I cannot convict people, but God, you can. Help them to see, God, that you are the answer to everything they are looking for. And help them turn their lives over to you right now, Lord. 
and maybe they, they would block me out right now, God, and they would just pray a simple prayer and make you the king of their life. They would just ask you to forgive them of their sins. Believe that you died on the cross for their sins. You rose from the grave, and you are sitting at the right hand of God right now, and you will return someday and destroy evil once and for all. And God, I pray that right now they would make the decision that they're going to follow you the rest of their life. God, I pray for all of us that you would do a work in our lives, you do a work in this church, God, and you do a work at this, the people that aren't even here right now. Mold us and shape us, God. Change this world to be a reflection of you, God. And help us first as God's people to reflect you. And we love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. If um, you did give your life to Christ or you've got questions about that, I would love to talk to you after. Or you can find uh, maybe another one of our leaders or someone around here to talk to you. But uh, please, if you did, do not leave here without talking to somebody and finding out more. Um, but thanks for coming. Uh, next week, we're going to be at our church building, 169 West Ships Road. Really quick, if you need a ride, uh, please, uh, either if I'm not available, just go talk to someone the the food cart or even that new card is right on there. I need a ride and drop in the offering box. We'll make sure you get a ride this week. So anyways, have a great week. Love you all. See you guys next week.